and then and people can just get in automatically now that I've started it, right? I don't need to yep. let them in. All right. So it's being recorded. Oh, I'm going to make you a co-host, I think. Yep. All right. You should have a... You should have a pop yep. up there. Uh, well, I, I know it is because I see the bottom part. I have a lot more icons. Okay, so. you, have, you have more choices. Yes. And I'm going to look at per attendees. Okay, Tim McCarthy is going to present. Um, I'm not seeing any other trust members as of yet. Okay. Okay. Uh, Rob is here, so I'm going to allow him to come in, promote the panelist. Rob has joined us. Hi, Rob. Oh. Hi, Rob. Okay. So we're waiting for Grover, Allegra, and Ashley. Um, Paul cannot be here. Oh, here's Ashley. Hi, Ashley. Hello. Hi there. We're waiting for Allegra. And then we can actually start uh, Allegra and Grover, and then we could start. Then we'll have quorum. Oh, here's Allegra, and then we just need Grover. No Carol tonight. Um, Carol is at the CPA. Oh. Uh, she uh, she will try to join us as uh, soon as she can, um, but she is presenting at the CPA. And same with Nate. And Dave is uh, staffing, helping to staff. And Paul is at a town town meeting. Oh, here's Carol. Actually, Carol is joining us. Okay. All right, Carol, I think you're here with us. Uh, the only person missing right now is Grover. Let's just wait one more minute and then we will proceed. Oh, here's Grover. Okay, great. Uh, we have quorum. All right, well, thank you very much for joining us. It is 7.02 and I'm calling the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust to order. Um, tonight, before we proceed, um, I just want to let you know, we have Carol with us, even though she was just presenting at the CPA. So thank you for joining us, Carol. Um, and Nate is uh, going to be, he probably will have to stay there longer. So he will not be here, but we have Craig or Shane and hopefully um, Nate will come and do a proper introduction. Greg is actually um, the affordable housing coordinator. So he just started this week and we are very, very grateful for him to uh, have taken the position. And um, when Nate joins us, uh, he will give a proper introduction and a proper welcome to Greg. But on behalf of the trust, um, we are very excited to have you here. Um, and, and this evening, um, Rob is going to take the notes uh, for us. So thank you, Rob. Uh, George Ryan uh, cannot make it this evening, and I just want to do a shout out of appreciation to him because he's consistently taken notes, and when he hasn't, then Rob has stepped in, so thank you, Rob. Um, so we're going to start first with the review of October minutes. Um, does anyone have any um, omissions, corrections, comments? I'm not seeing any hands. And I'm only, uh, just so you know, I only see a few of us uh, members all at once. So if uh, if I miss somebody, please let me know. 
I'm not seeing any hands, so I, I think we are going to accept the minutes as they stand since there are no comments uh, or no feedback uh, or corrections. So the October minutes uh, have been accepted by the trust. So thank you. We're now gonna to move to the next item on the agenda, which is an update on the strategic planning process. And I'm going to hand it over to Grover to give us an update. Yeah, so the information is that we did the, the grant for technical support and we the town has signed a contract with um, the person who will be supporting us in doing the strategic planning. And her name is Shelly. And we... The next step is that she is going to reach out to a list of people that provided um, the three of us that are on this committee, as well as city staff, to get the information that she needs. And our goal is to come back to you at our next meeting with a schedule set and everything ready to roll and moving forward. Thank you, Grover. Carol, do you want to add anything to that? That sounded fine to me. Thank you. And thank you, Grover and Carol, for moving this forward. Um, it's pretty exciting um, that the you know mass, uh, par uh, mass Housing Partnership uh, is the one that's going to be working with us to do this because they have a lot of experience in doing this and working with strategic plans with municipalities, affordable housing trust and municipalities. So thank you. All right, any questions, any comments? Okay, not seeing any hands up. I'm gonna continue. So we have Tim McCarthy here from Craig's Door. He's the executive director. Um, he provided to us a proposal and I'm going to uh, allow him to go ahead and present um, to us uh, the proposal and he's also available to answer any questions. Um, so, Tim, I am going to promote you to panelists so you can go ahead and share with us um, the proposal and then we will open it up for any questions and discussion um, and let's go from there. So thank you very much, Tim, for joining us. Greg, can you all hear me okay? Yes, yeah. thank you. Terrific. Uh, so I just wanna start off by thanking everyone um, in this group for being so incredibly supportive and uh, dedicating so much time and energy um, in finding ways that we can appropriately work together and collaborate at a deeper level um, and for you all to be able to support us. Also, Greg, before I forget, um, welcome. And uh, I would love the opportunity for us to connect, particularly as we're in the process of um, searching for our housing navigator and filling that vacancy, um, which is like, you know, intersected at a, at a pretty deep level. Um, so I wanted to, after getting some feedback, um, I wanted to really create a space for this to be a dialogue and for uh, me to be able to address any concerns, questions, offer clarity um, regarding the content of the proposal that I'd submitted. Um, and before kicking that off, I just wanna give a quick overview uh, both of sort of an update on where Craig's Doors is at from just like a very factual metrics focused um, perspective. Um, and then a quick overview of uh, our proposed ask and the project that it is tied to. Um, and then I really just wanna, again, offer the space to answer any and all questions. Um, so Craig's Doors uh, remains the uh, low threshold shelter for the region. Um, we operate three sites between Hadley and Amherst. We have our congregate shelter at um, Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Amherst, which supports 28 individuals, um, providing housing, case management services and meals. Uh, our non-congregate site at the former Econo Lodge in Hadley um, is a um, partnered effort with Valley CDC um, that provides shelter meals and support to 38 individuals um, and our uh, resource center, um, which is also right sort of in the center um, of, of Amherst um, as you approach the, the UMass campus um, is up and running and evolving um, and helps between 20 and 40 community members on average per week. Um, those numbers are all on a positive trajectory. 
Um, we operate the only emergency shelter operated free and fair public transit program in the country, um, offering autonomy and agency to all of our guests. We're partnering with a variety of legislators on that initiative to gather data um, and hopefully create broader uh, supports and projects um, to other communities. Um, uh, we, most importantly, I think we've evolved from a seasonal overnight shelter into a program that operates 24-7, 365, uh, allowing us to circumvent the limitations that the housing crisis has put on the housing first model um, and allowing us to really exercise innovative solutions in combating chronic homelessness. Um, we're a totally different organization than we were a year ago. Um, we are young, we're enthusiastic, we're innovative, um, and we're progressive. Um, our executive team um, in recognizing a gross disparity between executive pay and uh, frontline compensation um, within the space that we operate, uh, we have um, intentionally imposed a um, self-restricted cap on compensation. So no one at Craig stores will ever make, well, pending inflation, no one at Craig stores will earn over $70,000 um, in most organizations of our size, executive directors often make $120,000, $140,000 just to provide you with a, a sort of um, reference guide. So we're really trying to live our principles and our values of, of equity and recognizing that um, the crisis surrounding folks who, who remain unhoused, often chronically unhoused, um, is a manifestation of wealth inequality uh, in our country. I want to also emphasize we are not trying to be self-righteous or high horsing. Uh, we want everyone to be able to, to earn uh, and to be able to aggregate wealth uh, in America. There's plenty of opportunity, just not pulling from this specific pocket of resources that is dedicated exclusively to helping unhoused folks. Um, so it's not a judgment or like a, a moral condemnation. It's it's just um, what's worked for us. It's also radically self-serving. Craig Stores does not have the turnover that other providers have. We don't have recruitment issues. Um, you know, uh, we've we've really become a sort of magnet for people who want to engage in compassionate and trauma-informed service, um, and that's something that we're radically proud of. So um, we have been approached. Um, about potentially taking on um, a, a, a contract with um, the Bureau of Substance Abuse Services, which is a subsidiary of the uh, Massachusetts Department of Public Health, um, along with, uh, sorry, the uh, Bureau of Substance Addiction Services and the Bureau of Infectious Disease and Laboratory Sciences. So all working together under um, MDPH uh, in um, a procurement opportunity to reduce homelessness, improve health outcomes, and advance health equity for residents who are experiencing homelessness and substance use disorder and may be at a high risk of HIV acquisition. Um, there is flexibility here in terms of um, program um, uh, in terms of being, uh, I'm so sorry, uh, an adequate, an appropriate fit for the program in terms of, of being um, a viable and appropriate fit. So it does expand beyond those parameters. It deals with complex mental health issues, a lot of comorbidity. Um, and it, so really targeting the most vulnerable members of our community. Um, the, the procurement through DPH um, is a, uh, it's a one, a 12 month contract for 15 participants. Um, with $40,000 aggregated per participant. Um, and so this is really the first, um, the first opportunity that I've seen uh, to actualize the Housing First model. Um, just a, a super quick overview. Um, the Housing First strategy is endorsed by both HUD and the US Interagency Council on Homelessness as the best practice for governments and service agencies in their fight to end chronic homelessness. Um, it's a policy that proposes unconditional permanent housing as quickly as possible to un unhoused individuals, predicated on the concept that unhoused individuals or households first and primary need is to obtain stable housing, and that other issues that may affect the household can, can and should be addressed once housing is obtained. Um, again, we work exclusively uh, with adult individuals. Um, but this is a policy that spans all uh, of, of unhoused conversations and approaches in the States, also in Europe. 
Um, it's an effective solution to homelessness, and it's also a form of cost savings. It reduces the use of public services like hospitals, jails, and emergency shelters, um, particularly when it's properly executed. What historically, particularly in our region, has, has been the problem is that we get folks into housing and we don't provide them with the support services that are required um, to help these folks reach a level of self-efficacy and independence. And um, that's where we are going to be able to really innovate. Um, our approach involves creating two uh, living wage jobs um, by expanding our case management team. So there will be two full-time individuals focused exclusively on supporting um, this caseload. Um, we will be looking to subsidize rent. Um, half of the, the $40,000 um, is ideally applied towards rental costs, the other half towards um, service and support. Um, folks who do have an income will also uh, be expected to contribute between 10 and 30% towards the housing initiative. Um, we're in a unique position that uh, unless, again, I'll answer any and all questions directly and transparently, um, but I'll just, I'll just leave it at, um, there are folks who are in a program like this right now um, uh, in town um, and that we'd be coming in to sort of help, uh, help turn it around. I'll just, again, I'll, I'll leave it right there for now. Um, so the ask from you all uh, is for one hundred and eighty thousand um, dollars. It would it, the, all of those funds would exclusively go toward rental subsidy for the fifteen program participants. One thousand dollars per month for twelve months. Um, we uh, have kind of crunched the numbers, and this is a one-year need. We will not be returning. The program will become self-sustaining after this year. Um, the program also uh, sort of fundamentally supports um, a variety of expansion efforts. So holistically as an organization, um, it really provides us with an opportunity uh, to have a sort of gateway um, in terms of uh, helping folks progress through uh, the system. So entering congregate shelter, non-congregate shelter, and then uh, eventually, um, particularly if, if we're able to see expansion um, in the number of units, entering into these low threshold programs um, or again alternative housing solutions where appropriate. Um, the objective in supporting these folks is to put them in a space where uh, they can feel safe, um, they can call home, um, they can exit the sort of survival mode um, that folks are forced to uh, operate from um, when living rough or sleeping rough, uh, providing them with the services and then helping them graduate from this program um, and into their own independent living arrangement. Um, so we're able to, again, sort of cycle uh, through the entire community um, of folks that are, are currently living unhoused, address their unique needs, um, and exercise whatever flexible supports are required through shared decision-making, recognizing that you know their, their expertise and knowledge of their own histories and what's worked, what hasn't worked, um, and their goals for their future are met. And so it's, it's really walking shoulder to shoulder with these tenants um, and, and helping them to, to reach a level of self-efficacy. Um, so I, again, I kind of, I think that that really covers up the, the, the foundation and I, I just want to open this up to be a dialogue. Any and all concerns, questions I, I, I want to be able to address um, and I want to leave the majority of the time uh, for that purpose. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you, uh, Tim. That was a great overview. And thank you for the proposal you submitted prior so everyone could read it and be prepared. Uh, Allegra, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yes. Um, first of all, I think Housing First is an amazing model. So I'm really glad that you guys are doing that. Um, I just want to make sure I understand the $1,000 is to go above and beyond what the subsidy will already cover, or that is subsidizing that is the that is the subsidy so that's a that, thank you that's a really important question I, I should have touched on it in my overview the the fun so the funding itself through the program affords us an opportunity to help mitigate inherited administrative costs in in getting caught up organizationally from a financial uh, perspective in terms of filing and, and the performance of audits. Um, I'm happy to go into more detail there. All I can, all I can say um, is that 
it was the product uh, of a, a, a less developed and more immature iteration of our current organization. Um, and so the idea would be that uh, we're already a, appointed the opportunity by BSAS to take um, a, a substantial portion of the contract and put it towards those administrative costs to support our organization holistically. Um, in doing so, though, every dollar that is is utilized for our program's uh, security and benefit is removed from the resources available to the participants. Um, and so our our hope um, is that we can sort of rally around uh, municipal supports so that the funding is going directly towards rental subsidy, which allows us to be more creative in the utility and application of the remainder of the funds in the contract. I'm sorry, that was so convoluted. I didn't mean it to be, I'm just. So I just want, I, cause I, know. I, I yeah. like a long time ago when I was working in Boston, we had like shelter plus care vouchers. So is that kind of what the BSAS funds it is? It's the, obviously the support staff, but also a portion of the funds are going towards the, so it would be like a voucher. Exactly. Um, a little different from a voucher only in that like we have the whole it's like it's really a housing first i've never seen a program that actualized the housing first model so authentically like it, it's going to cover the rent for a full year and then the remainder of the funds that are available for each individual those are unique circumstances unique rental agreements etc but all of the remaining funding goes to uh again expanding our case management team to allocate staff who are always available but then it's to be able to support whatever the individual needs are specific to each person. So again, it's rental cost, internal uh, expansion in terms of our case management supports, and then whatever else they need. It could be vital documentation. It could be uh, mental, you know, subsidizing the cost of mental health care, uh, physical, um, like general health. Um, could be bringing in uh, peer supports or sobriety coaches, whatever. And in some cases, the department explained like someone bought a bike once, someone bought a television. It's it's just to really help develop a healthy and and improved quality of life for these folks while they really work towards self-efficacy. A, a, a portion also goes towards training our case management staff, those two folks in a variety of interventions. We're really focused on motivational interviewing in particular. We've seen like the most... Um, substantial impact um, by exercising uh, that that intervention um, and really operating from a humanistic lens. So I, I think I captured what you what you'd ask, um, mm -hmm. but I know it's a it's a complex point of discussion. Um, it, it, it's it's really straightforward, except that it's not. Okay. So I have one other question. Can I ask my one other question? Please. Yes, but let me just clarify that what we're funding is the rental That's subsidy. Right. So what we're doing is we are helping build with the small amount of funding that we're providing, helping to build a real complex supportive developmental um, partnership with That's Craig's right. door with those 15 individuals. Go ahead, Allegra. Go ahead. My, yes, my other question was just to clarify, are these, 15 individuals already housed. So by not providing these funds, they would be at risk of home returning into homelessness. Yes. So, so there's a sense of urgency in other words. Oh yeah. E e yeah. Major, major exigency in, in, in a few different ways, but that's the primary one. Yeah. Rob, you had your hand up. Um, I think most of my question was, Covered by Allegra's questions. Um, one one other question that I had though was, uh, you described this as being inherited, an inherited program. You're, you're inherited from some other organization or some previous iteration of, of okay. Yeah, the first the first one. Yeah, another organization. Okay. Thank you, Rob. That's an important distinction. Thanks. Carol, you have a hand up. Um, yeah, I just I just wanted to because this didn't come clear to me in what you were saying right now, Tim, but it has been clear in other times when we've talked about it. Okay. One important thing about it to me seems that this is a three year funded program 
and we are only asked to do the first year of the rental and then the pro and because that's what they need to do something else with and then but the next two years are already in place and presumably at the end of three years the people will be able to be somewhere permanently housed yeah i mean ideally ideally carol the we're actually looking at at um what is intended by the folks who are administering this this initiative for to be a 10 20 year program like a very long term program um we have to go through this sort of uh initial period um about 3 years but we're hoping that by year 1 we'll be able to transition and gra or graduate the vast majority of program participants into independent living and then bring in the next the you know in 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 perpetuity sort of um, bring folks who are in particularly um, vulnerable positions into the space, get them the support, move them into independence, you know, and, and et cetera, like, you know, ad nauseum. But you already are funded for three years of doing it at least. So that's like, I think that's amazing. It doesn't happen very often. <laughs> no, it doesn't. You're right. Ashley? Oh, sorry. No. I'm not the... <laughs> no problem. You go ahead, Tim. <laughs> not my job. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I mean I mean I'm definitely in favor of this and I I just, you know, want to reiterate like you know, a basic apartment in Amherst often is about $1500 and so you need first last and deposit it often and so that is $4500 ish to move into an apartment in Amherst and many people who are homeless and also people who are working don't have $4500 on hand. And so these are people that probably can't live in Amherst without it. And that's what Amherst has decided to be. We are not a town that welcomes people who don't have $4,500 just sitting in a bank account. So, and I want, I personally want people who don't have $4,500 just hang, hanging out to live in Amherst. I think it makes it a better town. I want to welcome people who don't have that much money into Amherst. I don't want to just hang out with people, just rich people. So I am totally in for this, <laughs> you know, and, and, and it takes a while to get $4,500 and I work. And so this is, this would be good. Yeah, Ashley, I, 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 you touched on so many things that I'm really grateful for. I think the the conversation surrounding diversity, financial diversity and experience and, and the social makeup of a community is radically important. I also want to, you touched on another, um, components surrounding vouchers. And um, it's important for everyone to understand that the way that vouchers are, uh, housing vouchers are exercised and applied in our region is based off Springfield's FMR or, for, or fair market rate. So the voucher's intention is to help subsidize to a significant degree uh, housing costs. Um, but when you, when you move into a, a community like Amherst and there's such a difference in the housing market, those vouchers don't actually provide any realistic or adequate support towards allowing them to remain in their in their community of origin. So I, I just wanted to share that that additional piece of context for what you're saying and, and thank you as always. So I'm not seeing any hands up from the trust members and I wanna recognize if any of the attendees wanna ask a question, um, whoops, I'm sorry, somebody just put their hand up among the trust members, Rob. Rob. <laughs> Sorry, uh, um, you you mentioned that, or you said that that uh, you expect to be self sustaining mm -hmm. um, a year from now. What, what meaning? What more funding from uh, these this program, or how, how is it going to be self sustaining? So, what it comes down to, and I, I just want to be careful about how I articulate this. There are. Um, there are organizational operating costs right now. Um, okay, I, 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 you said you did cover this. I just didn't get it. Okay, yeah, now I get it. cool. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Allegra, um, this is probably more of a question for Paul or Nate, um, who are not here, but I just I know that we, or at least when we talked about ARPA funds at the beginning of ARPA funds being a thing, there was a million dollars earmarked for the shelter situation and then a million dollars earmarked for other affordable housing initiatives that as far as I can tell have have we haven't touched that pot of money. 
is that I don't know if Erica or Carol might be able to answer that question or if or if ARPA might be another like pot of money that could be pulled from for this if, if the trust does not approve of this. You're right that Nate would have a better answer. I just stayed a little bit longer at the CPA presentation because Nate was making a presentation about what the town was asking for. And so I heard him say in that presentation that one of the things the town has used some of its ARPA housing funds for was to give money outside the CPA process and outside asking us to both Valley CDC for maybe Ball Lane, I'm not sure, but definitely to Wayfinders for the project that is Belchertown Road and East Street. So my short answer without asking Nate more is that the town is holding that pot kind of tightly, but they are they have done some things with it because I know they've done those things and they've also used ARPA money for the VFW project. So mm -hmm. how much they have left, whether they've used it all, I don't I don't know, but I know that they've used it in those three cases, at least some of it. That's all I know. Allegra, I can maybe for the context for the for the purpose of this conversation it would be helpful mm -hmm. i the, my first approach was to the town and so <laughs> it was made clear that they that uh funds from for the arpa funds have already either been uh distributed or they are already earmarked for allocation in other projects um and that this yeah they just didn't have the capacity they wanted to and they have been really supportive even in in facilitating this dialogue um but it, that's not an option, unfortunately. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Of course. So um, just because I think it's a, such an important conversation, I do want to open it up if any of the attendees have any questions uh, for us to also consider, maybe we haven't considered or any comments. So I'm just going to leave a minute to see if any hands come up. I mean, it's very long. So not seeing any. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask the trust members again. Are there any other questions or comments? Um, do Are we at a point where we want to move forward with considering this? We will need a vote. Oh, OK, there's a hand up here. Grover. Yeah, I just have a question um, for uh, I'm going to guess that it's Eric and Carol, but it's specifically about which like line item of our budget this would be. Are there restrictions on the line item of the budget that this is eligible to come from versus not? Because, you know, the totals at the bottom yeah. are one thing and then the sub buckets are another. Right. Yeah, it will be the development funds. So be specific CPA funding. So, um, you know, we're very clear that CPA funding can only be directly for subsidizing rent or subsidizing mortgages or developing affordable housing, such as the projects that we've um, provided funding towards. So it would be specifically out of, um, and, and what uh, Grover is mentioning is um, Nate had sent us a financial uh, document that we all have as a handout, except for the attendees possibly. Um, and so it comes straight out of that um, line item. And then a follow-up question is, we have applied for more CPA funding and that will be dispersed. So it's likely that that pot will be refilled with more funds in the coming year. Um, I would like, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. I think Carol did a wonderful presentation today. Um, the CPA members seem to be very committed to affordable housing, but we're not the only um, people asking for affordable uh, housing funds. Um, I do believe uh, because they've in the past been very, very supportive of us. Uh, we've asked for 500,000. The past we've asked for 500,000, we've gotten half and sometimes a little less than half. Um, but I think Carol did a really good presentation today of why it's necessary for us to have those funds. And Carol also discussed, and I'm sorry, I'm talking to you uh, for you, Carol, but you can you can certainly jump in. Um, uh, Carol also discussed what our funding looks like right now um, and what are some of the possible projects that people are coming forward to ask us for funding to support. So um, I think she did a really great job in um, stating why we need those funds. <clears throat> 
I have, um, I'm kind of ready to go forward with this. The one thing that is still confusing, or one thing I'd like to have maybe more detail about, and it's an, and it's innate, it's innate, it's how will this funding, how will these funds actually be dispersed? So because I, they're, go ahead. Sorry, this is a conversation that I've had with Nate and Dave. So essentially, um, the the subsidy would be provided in a lump sum um, upon agreement, and then every month we will be providing you all um, with records of of this of the application of those funds to each individual um, rental cost. So that's really the primary reporting function, um, provided that that uh, we have the honor of of being awarded and in partnership with you all a bit more concretely through this initiative. Um, so monthly reporting uh, and records uh, surrounding um, the rental subsidies themselves in, in an upfront um, payment to assist in, in ensuring that we have the capacity to immediately start assisting and inheriting um, those, those uh, rental obligations and, and spending obligations. Does that answer your question, Carol? Pretty much. So that means we, we give you get the hundred and eighty thousand dollars all at once, and then we get record of what you've done with it as it happens. Yeah, it's the idea is to take the administrative burden off of the town, so you guys aren't essentially acting as as landlord or leasees or administrators for for each individual, and and so that falls to us. We provide the reporting. So, um, and if there's ever any questions, obviously we would we would provide whatever additional detail might be of interest. We'll we'll be personal, like not personally, we'll be internally collecting a variety of data points as we've become sort of a very, uh, we're modeling the importance of, of data um, in terms of providing empirical, empirically supported solutions. Um, so, you know, we'll have tons of reporting, but in terms of the actual uh, allocation and distribution, it comes, like you'd said, upfront, which is magic to us in a world of <laughs> state reimbursement contracts. Right, I know what you um, mean. Yeah, it's so, I just can't tell you how critical this is so right. so i that means i have i'm being probably a. no it's okay i'm putting on my finance hat which i actually wear a lot of the time when i'm not here anyway yeah. um so i'm wondering what happens if somebody drop are you sure that you are going to use every single month of every single person for yeah. the entire year so the hundred and eighty thousand dollars will be used up exactly and I mean, it's because somebody could get, I don't know, somebody could have to go to the hospital with. Sure. I don't know what could happen. So it, I'm just it, asking what the, what if there's some contingency thing like that, what would happen? Yeah. So the contingency is the maintenance of um, basically a wait list. So we're, we're, what we're preparing for is that someone graduates into independent housing. That's that's our ideal outcome. That's right. Right. Yes. Yeah. And so when that happens, we'll have folks who are already prepared to transition into those units. Um, and and to sort of take the place uh, of the previous participant. So in in perpetuity, we're always maintaining the relationship with the landlord um, and and the uh, the access to the unit. Um, so I have there's no question that the full um, 180 will be utilized, particularly because that provides us with the foundation thousand, right? That's like the first thousand that we're able to pull. And then we allocate from the larger contract um, to supplement where necessary to meet the full needs. Okay, I think that's my question. And if I, can just, if I can just add, um, Tim is going to be uh, responsible for providing um, documentation to the Department of Public Health. Oh, right, thank you. Substance Addiction Services and Biddles, the Bureau of Infectious Disease and Laboratory Sciences. So there's an added accountability there. Um, you know, definitely we, you know, we need our accountability, but there's a much larger added accountability as well as uh, data, which we would be great for us to, you know, for you to share with us totally. so we can see the success of this. Um, this is a great, you know, uh, I don't remember what you use, Carol, or, or what you used in terms, I don't want to use pipeline, but in a gateway, gateway yeah. to permanency for individuals who have experienced being unhoused. Um, and so this really maximizes the amount we are providing in order to get a lot in terms of having people be um, securely housed. Totally. And yeah, this $180,000 is ex exponentially more valuable than the actual number, like in terms of its broader impact and its future impact. It's so 
I can't even put a value on it. Um, I also just want to piggyback on what you'd said, Erica. And not only are we held accountable by those departments, we're also in partnership with them. So the supports that they're going to be able to provide us are super unique um, in comparison to our other state contracts that are sort of like, you know, execute on your own, provide us with the data and reporting that we need, but otherwise we're sort of hands off. This is going to be like a, a really hands-on supportive partnership to ensure our success. Yeah. And to hold and, us accountable. And Yes, and, and I, I want to go back to what you said before in terms of housing first. It is in um, the interest, especially in terms of commitment, um, and I say that because I'm a little biased. I used to work for the Bureau of Substance Addiction Services, but they are so committed in terms of having a comprehensive, holistic response to their community and uh, also have a partnership with community-based organizations like yours um, mm -hmm. that are very interested in social justice and in partnership and democracy. Um, so this is, they're looking at this as an opportunity to demonstrate success yes. uh, and pilot what you have been promoting for a long time, which is not just about housing someone, but it's really about their whole quality of life and their engagement in community, which is really important in community. So. Yeah. Uh, so beautifully said, yeah. I, I, yeah, <laughs> I can say is yes. Uh, that's precisely right. what, we're, what we're after here. Well, I think we're ready. Um, we're probably going to, unless there are any other questions, we're probably going to put you back in the attendees. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's see if I can put you back. Uh, I just want to, before I do, I just want to thank all of you again so much for your support and providing us this opportunity. I cannot state how critical this is to the future of our organization and just the fact that we're having a dialogue um, is so illustrative of, of, a, of a community that, that really acts on what it says um, in terms of values and principles. So thank you guys again. Before, before you kick him out, since Nate just got here, can we just see if Nate has anything he wants to say about the Craig's Door application since he's now here and maybe he can't even think about anything right now after whatever he's just been through, but feel free to say you don't wanna say anything, Nate, but do you have anything to say? No, I mean, I, I, I missed the, um... You know the discussion. I've read the proposal, so I don't. You know, I don't really have anything to add. I think it's something that, um, you know, that we, the town also sees as important. You know, in the trust, and so, um, you know, it's a difficult thing to. This kind of program is a difficult thing to fund uh, traditionally, uh, and so um, you know, getting services and housing together is really important. I think you know we know that, but it's something that hasn't happened uh, all the time, and so I think it's a it's a really nice opportunity right now. Thank you, Nate. All right, thank you so much, Tim. Um, thank, thank you, you for giving us the opportunity to have this conversation and um, follow our commitments. So I'm gonna change you back to attendee. Perfect. Thank you so much. All right, um, so who would like to make a motion so we can go ahead and first make a motion, any further discussion and then vote. Okay. So I move to take $180,000 from our development funds line item to fund the Craig's Doors proposal as presented to us. I second that. Any discussion? Not seeing any hands up. Giving a little more time. I think we're ready to vote. So I'm gonna call each person uh, to state their vote. Ashley? Yes. Allegra? Yes. Carol? Yes. Grover? Yes. Rob? Yes. Erica is a yes. So I think that is unanimous. Uh, the motion has passed. Thank you. This is really exciting. Um, okay, Nate, um, I think you actually moved the um, trust accounts to under this, but let's let's leave it under town updates. Is that okay with you? Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, so the next item on the agenda is the June 20th community listening session brief. Um, I, uh, we sent out, we sent out the um, brief um, and of course, you know, I absolutely want to apologize that it took so long to do, but as um, was stated in the brief, uh, it was 
somewhat challenging to ensure that the voices that um, came out of that listening session, as well as the individuals who submitted their comments and their feedback and shared their stories to really get it on paper and to as much as possible um, make sure that, um, that it was inclusive. Um, so what I just wanted to um, have us discuss is, um, is there any feedback, any omissions, anything that should be changed, as well as um, the planning group? So let me just uh, thank the planning group. Uh, Allegro was from the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee, along with Philip Avila, who was also from the Human Rights Committee. Um, there was uh, Nancy Gilbert from the Board of Health. Um, there was uh, Elizabeth Haygood from the Human Rights Committee, and then from um, our trust was Ashley Allegra and myself. So we were the planning uh, committee along with town staff Nate and Jennifer Moyston. Um, so um, we worked, you know, to put this uh, event together, including having a website where people could submit their comments, and we had a real rich conversation uh, on the night of June twentieth. Uh, and we also had wonderful submissions in terms of people's comments. But as you saw in the brief, it really created a range of recommendations. Um, and our intent was one, to provide an opportunity for individuals with lived experience in Amherst, as well as people who want to live in Amherst or work in Amherst or study in Amherst to really share their lived experiences with us in terms of the challenges um, around attaining affordable housing, uh, maintaining affordable housing, um, and trying to get affordable housing here in Amherst, uh, and have those of us who are committed to creating affordable housing be listeners in this. Um, and uh, we decided that we would do a brief or a report so we could share it with uh, town council, the town, uh, and others who were not able to be there or who were able to be there, but maybe didn't get the richness of all the whole conversation because they were in one group or another, uh, to really be able to have that information um, to help think about how to move forward with all of the really rich ideas um, that individuals were generous, generous enough to share. So two things, one is comments and feedback from you guys. The second is, who else should we distribute this to? So I have town council, I have um, town staff, uh, Representative Dom, who's here, um, Senator Comerford, uh, the attendees who left their emails with us. Uh, we were very clear that we wanted to keep things anonymous, but people had the opportunity to leave emails with us because they were interested in um, continuing making sure that affordable housing stays on the agenda and is a priority for the town. And then we have a trust email list. Um, so any other groups um, that we should include? Would it make sense to send it to Pamela Schwartz of the Western Mass Network? Thank you. Good idea. Very good idea. I'm going to jump in and say um, uh, Representative Dom has her hand raised. Yeah. And then yep. um, I think the planning board is another one that this could be directed to. Planning board. Thank you. Um, all right. Let me... Uh, Representative Dom, uh, you can go ahead and speak. Um, thank you so much, Erica. Hi, everybody. Um, I don't have to speak now because you're in the middle of this particular topic, or I can jump in, whatever is more convenient. I don't want to interrupt your flow. Um, it's fine. Please do. Well, in terms of who else should get this, I am thinking that you may want to make a social media post about the report and ask if someone wants a copy of it, but they can email a request because there may be people that aren't yet on your mailing list who are interested in it. Um, but the, the reason why I'm, I am wanted to just speak at some point tonight was, first of all, I wanted to introduce a new legislative aide, Grace Simmons, who's also watching um, tonight. And um, Grace just started about last week, I think, maybe this week. I don't know. My time has been vacant <laughs> for sure. Um, they're based in Boston, but one of their areas of specialty is housing. And so um, they will definitely be attending these and kind of watching and also seeing where we can be of support. Um, and you should also feel free to reach out to them. Um, I, can, um, I can't I can actually put the email address in the chat because I don't have access to the chat, but it's grace.simmons at mahouse.com. 
gov, and I can send that to you also, and Grace can send it to you actually. Um, so I wanted to introduce Grace. Um, I also wanted to thank Eric and Carol for participating in the meeting with the governor and the secretary of housing and livable communities when they came to visit. Um, and I think that was a critically important um, meeting because um, it got us on their radar in a way that we want to be, which is as a community that's saying yes. So um, I just, I really want to remind everybody that um, the governor introduced a $4.1 billion housing bond. Um, that's not the bond that will ultimately be decided on because it has to, it's a piece of legislation. It has to go through the legislative process. Um, unfortunately, I'm hearing concerns about revenue in the um, state, um, but that may not affect a bond because a bond is something we're borrowing over a long period of time and not just a one year fiscal year kind of budgetary item. But the reason why I'm talking about the bond right now is because in order to get money in the bond released for programs or communities, the governor is the person that does that. So you can like get all these different budgetary kinds of earmarks, so to speak, or programs in a bond. But in order for it to be released from the bond, the governor, whoever that is, has to sort of what they call pull the trigger. They have to allocate it. Um, oh. And so it's really good that to have the governor and the secretary in Amherst seeing what we're doing and also getting an earful from the senator and myself about all the things that are in the pipeline, including Craig's doors at the VFW site, because um, I'm certain that that will also end up in a bond, like some homeless service capital projects. Um, because then when we go back and look at what's, and you look at what's in the ultimate bond and say, you know, Mindy, how do we get our hands on that? You know, pointing to some dollar amount, we'd have to go and advocate and re-lobby to the administration, but now we're in their heads. So that's a good thing. Um, so I just really want to point out that those kind of meetings are really critical, not only because they get to show off what Amherst is doing, but in this case, it's really critical because we're going to go back um, and want some of that bond money to come to Amherst for affordable housing. So um, there's that piece. And I also just wanted to say one thing on the strategic planning, if you don't mind me jumping in here. I love strategic planning. Um, when I had to do it at the Amherst Survival Center, people warned me, I know it's very boring process, things get put on a shelf, blah, blah, blah. I loved it because it gave me an opportunity and the organization an opportunity to reach into the community and find out what people thought of us as an organization and also what they expected from us and from themselves, in that case, as it related to food security. And so it, it just gave us this incredible opportunity to have these conversations using the strategic plan as the basis for it and then having them inform the strategic plan. So I think an amazing opportunity, particularly at this juncture in the housing crisis in Amherst, as well as the Commonwealth, to be able to use the strategic plan to have these conversations. And conversations can happen lots of ways, right? They can happen with actual discussion. They can happen via survey. They can happen via listening sessions and public hearings, like a whole range of things. I'm not telling you how to do it at all. I'm just saying it's an incredibly exciting opportunity to uh, have folks sort of say what they expect in terms of affordable housing in Amherst in very specific ways. And I'm really looking forward to supporting you in any way I can with this, You know, whether at the very least promoting whatever opportunities you want people to engage in and really encouraging um, community engagement with you. So please count me in as a partner and an amplifier always, but especially around this kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative Dom. I see Tim has his hand up. So I'm going to go ahead. Oops. Uh, Tim, did you want to say something? Can you hear me okay? Yes, you can. I just wanted to ask that I be added to the distribution list as well. Whatever you, whatever mailing list it is that you guys have, that'd be great. I can reach out to you personally if, if I need that. Um, also, I thought you were i may well be carol I, I i just haven't seen the it was yeah i'll i'll keep an extra eye out send me send me your email in case i have it wrong or something i'm the keeper of the list and i'll make sure that it's on there correctly i just wanted to verify is all i also just wanted to thank everybody on the trust and uh also and i know that she's not going to love 
that I'm doing this, but I just have to shout out Representative Dom and her support for our organization as a whole, but particularly that transportation initiative. We would not be able to do some of the more innovative components of our work without um, her support and in, in, in her office's support in a myriad of ways. So I, just thanks everybody. I'm overwhelmed right now with gratitude and thank you all, every, just everybody. Really, really honored to work uh, in this community. Thank you, Tim. So any other suggestions? Uh, we will send it to uh, Pamela Schwartz, who has a massive list in terms of housing advocates and also housing advocates within Amherst. Um, I think we, we actually had an email list uh, that we sent flyers to. We'll use that email list as well. Um, and I think if you were to read the brief, I think it's a good starting point on some of the areas that people felt were, should be priorities for us around affordable housing. So that could be a beginning trajectory, but um, absolutely what Representative Dom stated. Uh, one of the things that were was very clear um, with regards to what I heard, and those of you who are there, um, please jump in. Um, and this is from, you know, the disability community, which is nothing about us without us. And so it's the same thing, you know, in terms of community engagement is that for individuals who have this lived experience, if you really, if we want things to be successful, we need to have individuals and community, um, their input, because they know if this is going to work or not in terms of the initiatives that we think are important or priorities. So um, community engagement is very, very important. And as Representative Dom said, that there are multiple ways of doing this. You know, we did a in-person um, session, uh, listening session, but we also were able to uh, ask people if they want to, to submit uh, comments. So uh, to increase, you know, the, the access to being able to provide input um, and then maybe um, also doing something virtually in the future as well. Allegra. Do we have a vacancy on the trust right now? We have two vacancies on the trust and I was, um, I was going to comment on that under the strategic plan and mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I meant to give an update um, then. Um, one of the things that we wanna make sure is before we start the strategic plan that our vacancies are filled, uh, we actually did interviews and we provided our feedback to um, the town manager, Paul, who unfortunately could not be here this evening. And Paul will make the ultimate decision uh, and then submit it to town council for approval. So um, I believe that's probably gonna happen within the next two weeks. So we should know um, who will be joining us. Um, and then we will have a full membership mm -hmm. and we can go into strategic planning with a full membership, uh, which you know we're hoping you know that we will have a plan for the next three to five years to really help us guide around priorities. I would just add that we, all of us who were involved in the interviewing, we interviewed, what was it, eight people, but one didn't show up or something like Great. that. Yep. Anyway, we thought we had a, we had the, we had a lot of, we had a lot of good candidates. So we just, we felt like we had a good pool. It was an excellent pool. I, I'm glad you mentioned that, Carol. Um, it really was very, very difficult because we had such good applicants who were highly committed, very diverse around experience, age, where they, you know, their backgrounds, uh, lived experience, it really, I suppose it was wonderful to have a very difficult decision, um, but Paul will be making the decision. We've given him our feedback, um, so we'll see. Um, but I think whoever joins us in those two positions, I wish we had four or five or six, um, but whoever joins us, I think will be extremely valuable in terms of the makeup of our group and uh, the experiences and the insight that they'll bring to this group. Okay, um, if anyone has any other ideas about who to distribute this to, uh, or if they're willing to work with me on a social media post, um, let me know. You could just email me or email Carol and me. Um, okay, so we're going to move to the next item, which um, Representative Dom sort of uh, introduced, which is the Governor's Affordable Homes Act. Um, it's it's a massive, hopefully you had an opportunity to take a look at it. Um, it really is very, very comprehensive. And for me, it really demonstrates that they have spoken and have listened to 
a wide range of uh, individuals who have lived experience who struggle with housing, uh, with advocates, uh, with those who have committed to affordable housing. It is really massive, but it's going to require a lot of our support um, when this comes up uh, in the legislature. We have to be uh, ready to, you know, write letters of support and really be behind this. Um, but it's, I mean, if if this all could be passed, um, you know, and quickly, um, I, I think you know it really would make a, a huge impact on affordable housing from um, helping individuals going from unhoused to affordable um, rental and from affordable rental to home ownership, especially for uh, communities, individuals who have been shut out of. Um, home ownership and affordability. So um, I'm going to open it up to see if anybody has any comments or questions about this. Um, we, as uh, Representative Dom stated, we were able to meet with Governor Healy, who actually, and with Secretary Augustus from the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, who actually toured East Gables uh, and were highly impressed by East Gables. Um, and uh, I think Amherst, uh, both uh, from Representative Dom and Senator Comerford, um, kept on um, providing examples of how Amherst has, one, been very, very committed to affordable housing, is you know committed to continuing to ensure that there's affordable housing, and also that there are a lot of firsts in Amherst in terms of creating um, such wonderful places like um, East Gables. Uh, and so... Um, it was really a wonderful opportunity to meet with them, and they were very, very um, attentive to what's happening in Amherst, as well as to individuals who are really struggling um, to stay in the community or to come into the community, especially if they work in the community. So I don't know, Carol, if you want to add anything or anybody wants to um, give any feedback uh, regarding the, the Affordable Homes Act. Nate has his hand up. I have I'm sorry, something thanks. I'll say, but let Nate go first. Nate, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was going to just mention that um, what um, Representative Dom said. It's that you know the you know the bill is great, but then the money has to be released, and that that's where um, you know writing letters of support or having um, you know having others also do it. So I think that it could be the trust needs to advocate. Um, you know, uh, if there's a you know, we have others through the um, Amherst Affordable Housing Coalition. If we ask others to write letters and support, that's kind of where um, I think it could make a difference. So, you know, I, you know, I've always heard that, you know, the state can only borrow so much every year. And so they really need to hear how important it is because, uh, you know, that, you know, it's unlikely they will reach the full, <laughs> the full amount that's being suggested. So it really is, you know, you know, if the trust has ideas in terms of priorities or just even just letting, you know, encouraging people to write letters, reaching out to different organizations, because I think that's what they'll need to hear. Um, that's all I was going to say. Um, I was going to say one thing, but I think I'm going to say something. I think I don't really understand how it works. Right now, it's a bill to even become for the bond even to be approved the legislature has to say yes this we approve this bond bill and but then after that after that happens then if any of the money gets released we have to fight about it again so my first question was the bill this list of things that we saw are we sure that that's what the bond was that what in the bond bill or do we have an opportunity to argue as we did to some extent when we saw the governor for changes to be made before it becomes a law because for instance the transfer fee right now the way it was written was set up you only get to charge a transfer fee on the amount above a million dollars that a house sells for so we're going to get 10 cents I mean, not 10 cents, but not very much. And there is a possibility, it seems to me, of having it say something about above 90%, something that would allow us, if it was based on our own housing sales that are in Amherst, to actually get something from it. I'd like to change it before it becomes a law, rather than just have to go and get money out of it 
maybe Mindy can answer this or somebody. Yes. Probably Mindy. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm being, I should know this, I'm sure, but I don't. So represent, we're lucky that Representative Dom is here and uh, <laughs> she has her hand up. But I also want to say that um, Anna, the Vice President of Town Council, actually raised that to the exactly. governor and Secretary Augustus. So thank you, Carol, because they heard it. Um, and I think that was a very important point, but I'm going to go ahead and let uh, Representative Dom speak. Thank you. I'm glad I stayed on. Um, okay, me too. <laughs> so first of all, Carol, please don't be um, upset with yourself for not understanding. This This can get confusing. And, and in some ways, it's not. It's pretty simple. So um, I'm hopefully going to explain it um, in a simple way. But before I do that, I do want to also reinforce that the message around the transfer fee in specific that could be used for um, Amherst advocacy is definitely what Vice uh, President of the Town Council, Anna Devlin Gauthier, presented. So she has the language um, that you that the trust may want to look at. Um, I also want to encourage you to think about what's missing from the bond that you think might be appropriate for Amherst. So this is the way the bond works. The bond is a bill, and so it's going to go through the legislative process. And because it's come from the governor, it's not the same bond that's going to end up um, resulting from the legislative process because both the House and the Senate are going to want to put their fingerprints on it. So it's going to change and evolve like any bill. I want it's it's like the budget, right? Governor Healy gives us a budget in like January, but basically the House and the Senate go through their own budgetary process using the governor's budget as sort of a framework, but not really paying too much attention to it. And ultimately we pass a budget, she signs it or she vetoes it. And if she vetoes certain things, we have the chance to override it. We don't, the veto piece of it doesn't happen with a bond. What's gonna happen is the bond will go through the legislative process. And by that, I mean, it will have a public hearing. It may have two different kinds of public hearing. The joint committee on housing will have a public hearing on it. And there's a committee on bonds that's for the House and one for the Senate. Each one may also look at it when it comes out of the housing committee. And so they'll have two different committees sort of previewing it before it gets to the respective houses committee on ways and means, because it has to go there before it gets voted on. They'll have an opportunity to massage it or kind of look at it differently. And then ultimately it will come to the floor of the House first for a vote. House members will get a chance to put up amendments to it. Um, I think we'll see what happens. They may want to actually get it done very quickly and try to discourage amendments from the floor. I don't think so. I think there will be amendments from the floor. Um, and then we'll vote on it. When we, we're done voting on it, it will go to the Senate. It starts with the House because it's a money bill. Then it goes to the Senate. They'll have a chance to amend it. Whatever they pass, assuming it's different than when the House passed, it'll have to be reconciled. Then the bill will go into a conference committee. It'll have a couple, three members of the House, three members of the Senate will go into a, a committee to figure out how they can reconcile these two different bills to create one unified bill that both houses agree on. And once they report out a conference report, which will be this reconciled bond, then the House and the Senate will vote on it, likely in favor of it because it'll come out of a conference and send it to the governor. Then she gets to decide if she's gonna sign it. I don't know how much it'll be. Will it be 4.1 billion? Maybe. Will it be 8 billion? Unlikely. Will it be less than 4.1 billion? I guess that depends on what the economy is doing at the time, to tell you the truth. But because it's a bond bill and not a budget, a budget, it goes into effect the next year and we start spending the money based on anticipated revenues. The bond bill is based on anticipated additional borrowing, not revenues, literally going to a bank and borrowing bucks. And so um, it doesn't get all borrowed at the same time. There's usually a time period in which you can borrow the money. So it's like a bond over a couple of years and you can, and you can spend it. But in order to quote unquote, release the money from the bond, i.e. get the governor to borrow the money that's in the bond for a particular purpose, that's kind of what's called releasing it. That's a whole bunch of other advocacy that will take place after the bond is set. So first we have to come up with how much are we gonna give permission to the governor to borrow and for what purpose? 
that has to come to agreement. And that's going to be through the legislative process. But then getting the governor to borrow the money for the specific purposes, that's separate lobbying and advocacy. Okay. And I think the what the governor did in this bond that you'll see is it's not just money. The, the interesting thing about this bond, it also includes policy. So like the transfer fee is a policy piece. It's not, she doesn't have to go and borrow any money for that. That's, she's actually taken the legislative effort to allow municipalities to do a transfer fee. And she put a version of that into the bond. So as you may know, there's like about, I think five or six bills about the transfer fee knocking around the legislature. Some are for specific towns, like Amherst has one for a specific town. Senator Comerford has a bill that is um, what's called enabling legislation that allows any municipality to do it and they don't have to come in with home rules. They can just do it. So the governor was, I guess, inspired by those efforts and she put enabling legislation for houses over a million bucks into the bond. That I don't know if that will pass ultimately in the House and the Senate because the House hasn't really demonstrated an appetite to pass tra transfer fee bills but because it's in the bond, it starts a different conversation than just individual legislation. It's actually great that it's in the bond because it shows that some municipalities need this tool very badly to be able to move forward with more housing. Um, I can talk about that in a moment, but I don't, I don't wanna belabor that. But there are other things that are housing policy that are included in the bond because I think she's looking at, well, this is a, we are in a housing crisis. What are all the, strategies we need to have at our disposal and towns need to have at their disposal to move forward out of this crisis. So some of that is money, but some of that is policy. So she made a bond with both. Um, and nothing is guaranteed at this point, except that that's what she would like to do. Um, but the House and the Senate are still going to get their whack at it. And then even when that's done, even when it gets signed, getting the money that's allocated in the bond for specific purposes will require additional advocacy. If policy ends up in the bond and she signs the bond, that policy will become like law. It'll come go into effect when it's supposed to go into effect. We won't need an additional hurdle, but to get the money, we will need the additional advocacy. Is that clear, Carol? Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> Complex and, and a lot of things to do. And it seems like a lot of opportunities for advocating all the way along the way. Yes. But thank so you I so much. Thank you, you very much. Sure, I would encourage you to think about the times to advocate and to submit support letters or to testify are going to be when the House has their public hearing on the bond in the Joint Committee yeah. proposing. Also, when they have a public hearing on the bond committee. And then it's going to be like you're going to and then that's advocacy that's directed to the committees, looping in the senator and myself so that we're aware of what you're doing and we can amplify it. Then you're going to want to lobby us on the bills that are going to be before us. And then once it's signed, we're all going to want to look and see where does Amherst want to get money and we're going to have to help um, do that. Um, so, you know, like, but I'm also encouraging you to look at the bond and look what's missing that would benefit Amherst. So, for example, I haven't looked at the bond very close, um, the governor's bond. So some of this is about what did she do? And then some of it is just like, well, what do we think should be done? And if she didn't do it, now's the time to advocate that it be included because the House will make it its own bond and so will the Senate. And so we want to advocate for the things that make sense for our community. So, for example... I don't know what she did in terms of net zero um, uh, building code, but Amherst has a very specific interest in that. So we're going to want to make sure that whatever Amherst interest is and the money that Amherst needs to implement Amherst's code is somehow represented in the bond. And I think it is. I think she has a green piece in terms of construction, but we're going to want to look at it through the eyes of what the Amherst bylaw is and say, does that help us? And if it doesn't, how do we make it help us? And then you're going to really want to make sure that the senator and I know that because that's where we have an opportunity to maybe um, incorporate in the bond specific kinds of things that would benefit Amherst. That is Thank so you. very, yeah, that's so very helpful. I mean, I know one of the uh, 
conversations we had um, just was, you know, the fact that she included the seasonal communities designation. We yep. actually wanted to know if that could be expanded to college towns because that that also, you know, sort of impacts towns. Uh, so thank you for. Um, I think what uh, Lynn, I think what Lynn Griesmer suggested, which is really fascinating and one something I'm going to look forward to advocating, is that it should be according to the academic calendar, in addition Absolutely. to the seasonal, which Absolutely. I thought was very interesting because it's not only for us. That allows us as legislators to go to other host communities for academic institutions and say, hey, did you see this piece? We could benefit from an academic year. Um, and I have to be honest with you, whatever we can do to say it's not just Amherst, it's us plus these other communities increases Absolutely. the chances we're going to get it done. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm not going to let you go until I'm just going to check with the rest of the trust members to see if they have any other questions. It's such a great opportunity to to for us to better understand one what this means and two how we can support it. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of pieces here that we've had individual support that we've provided individual support to, um, you know, such as. Um, I mean, there's just so many pieces. We're interested in, in worker housing. We're interested in green housing. We're interested in, you know, developers having, you know, the, the funds, especially, you know, as construction costs get uh, increase, you know, transfer fees, inclusionary zoning. There's just so much surplus public land dis disposition. Um, we know that UMass has a surplus mm -hmm. land. We know um, the state has surplus land that we could use for affordable housing. So there's a lot here. Uh, eviction ceiling. Um, there's just so much here that we've supported in the past mm -hmm. and bring it all together. But um, having a lens of what's not here and what we need is really important. So that's, I'm so glad you raised the eviction ceiling because that's a good example of a policy piece that's included in the bond, right? It has nothing to do with money and borrowing but it has everything to do with keeping people housed. Um, you know. And then there's the other flip side, which is like, what does it do about wage theft? Since we know wage theft happens a lot on construction sites, and if we're gonna be building a lot of affordable housing, how can the bond be used to also address wage theft? Like, it kind of, it allows us to touch on a lot of different things, but I'm glad you mentioned that, Erica, because that kind of shows how policy is being used as a strategy around housing. Absolutely. Uh, Rob has a question for you or a comment. Rob? You're mute. Too. Yeah, sorry. Oh, trying to mute. Am I mute, unmuted? You're unmuted. Yes. Okay, yes. Um, it's, a, it's a comment, not a question. Um, so it, it's important for uh, lots of eyes to look at this, what's in there, because different things jump out to different people. I noticed. Um, Right above the local option transfer fee, there's language about accessory dwelling units as of right, mm -hmm. which is fine with me. Uh, permits ADUs to be built by right single family zone contestants in all communities. What what I think it would be a problem in Amherst is prohibits owner occupancy requirements. That because that 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 just means duplexes are allowed um, in every by right, and and people don't like that. So um, so there are things in there that. There might be things that aren't in here that we um, want, but there also looks like there might be things in here that we don't want. Right. All of it needs to be, I, I'll be honest with you, making a list and not only using it as a basis for your own testimony and support or your comments to the uh, committee is important, but also then getting Senator Comerford and I that list is really important for our ability to advocate for the town. If we don't know that there's an objection to something, we won't. We may not be successful in getting it out, or we may be, but we won't even know that we should put it on our list of things to talk about if we if we don't get it from you. Thanks for pointing that out. Anyone else? Thank you so very very much, Representative Dom. Um, Thank you so very much. Grace is still on, so um, they'll be listening for us and advocating, and they're great. I am so looking forward to um, their contribution to not just my office, but to all of you. So look and forward thank to it. You. Thank you for having Grace be the person who's going to be joining us at each meeting. Uh, we always love to have you here. 
Uh, but we know how busy you are. So uh, having Grace is excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. I'm going to sign off. Thank you, everybody. I'll be in touch. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Bye-bye. Okay, so our next item on the agenda is uh, town updates. So Nate, um, and if you could include the financial um, statement as part of it. So just so you know, I did a very peripheral, peripheral introduction of Greg, um, and I did not do justice to um, providing an introduction. So I said we would wait until this time period and that you would do that, but I did welcome Greg and others did as well. So go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. So, um, you know, Greg is here. He's was hired. I uh, started just this week as the housing coordinator, uh, part time associate planner. Um, Greg could speak in a bit. So we're really excited. You know, this is funded through CPA, through the town and through the housing trust. Um, <clears throat> we're really hoping it can help augment, you know, staff and trust capacity. Um, you know, we're looking at short term things that the position can do and the longer term involvement in projects, you know, the strategic plan, uh, we need the housing production plan updated. Greg has, you know, personal and professional experience and interest in this. And so we're really excited to have him on board. Uh, Erica was part of the um, interview process. Uh, it was a, you know, um, there were some strong candidates as there were for the, you know, um, applicants for, to be on the trust itself. And so we're really fortunate that, you know, uh, Greg accepted the offer um, you know, Greg, if you want to say a few words, I don't know if I want to put him on the spot. Um, you know, I will say that Greg uh, works through me and through the co-chairs of the trust. And so, you know, what we can do is at meetings and through, you know, the strategic planning process, determine what are tasks that would be, um, that Greg could be involved with. So I, I'm, I don't want individual trust members emailing Greg, asking him to do things uh, for them uh, or for the trust. It really has to be something that's decided on uh, by the trust and communicated through the co-chairs and myself. And so, you know, there, I think there's a lot of things. Uh, we already have a, a number of tasks we want them to start on and, and there can be more. So uh, we're really excited to have, have this position. And I, can I just add, um, Greg only works 22 hours. So that's one <laughs> of the reasons why um, Nate is very clear about um, that he will, you know, that we will be working together with Greg and that we really need for people to come through us. Uh, we want to make sure that Greg does not leave because he's overwhelmed by all of us. <laughs> we want to keep him as much as possible. So welcome, Greg. Well, thanks. I'll just say a quick hello if that's okay. Um, uh, so yeah, again, Greg Rashane, and I'm uh, uh, I'm super excited. You know, I've, I've been uh, just reading a lot this week, honestly, absorbing a lot of different documents. So it's exciting to um, to sort of be with uh, with all of you, kind of um, you know digging into some compelling stuff live in the moment here. Um, it's definitely energizing. Um, so I, uh, you know, have done um, a, a lot of work, uh, mostly in the nonprofit sector over my life. Um, uh, but um, housing has been something I've come back to uh, in, in a few different ways, both professionally and as a volunteer um, in other parts of the world and also here in the Valley. Um, uh, and I, um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested, you know, I mean, Ashley made a good point earlier about, you know, wanting to create opportunities for, for people of, of a wide variety of incomes, you know, to live in places like Amherst. And that's something that's driven me for uh, a long time. So I'm, I'm excited to sort of do that work with all of you. Um, and I, I should note too, that I have, um, I've been doing that work as a volunteer for some time now um, on the board of, of Valley CDC, which is a partner, um, you know, that, you know, that works with Amherst and the trust. Um, so, you know, when we hit those junctures, there'll be times for me to sort of manage, you know, uh, appropriately conflicts and disclosure and all that. And, but I have been in touch with the state ethics board on, uh, you know, on, on how to approach that. And I've got some good guidance there. Um, um, so, but, but there's nothing on the agenda this evening, uh, you know, so we don't have anything uh any, any hiccups there um but yeah so that's a little note but 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 i you know but that work more more broadly that work uh is is you know something i've been excited to do as a volunteer so i'm you know i'm excited to to be with you all on, on staff here too um so yeah i live in east hampton but uh, uh you know but i'm um you know i'm i'm definitely uh familiar with the, with the region and i you know i used to run a le regional leadership development program so i really got to know uh you know kind of all the different communities around the region from Springfield all the way up to Greenfield and certainly including Amherst. And uh, yeah, so that's kind of a bit about me, uh, you know, but I'll, maybe I'll stop there and, you know, um, but, but I'm excited to be here, I guess is the main point. 
We are very excited to have you here. Um, and especially, I think this is such a great opportunity with us going into a strategic planning process. So we will all be creating the vision for the next three years in terms of priorities and what we want to do. So it's great to have you with us at this time. Yeah. And I'll just, you know, maybe it's worth adding. Thanks, Erica, if, if I could, you know, it, it, you know, following Representative Dom's, um, uh, you know, suggestion to you all, you know, um, community engagement, outreach, you know, is, is something I've done a great deal of um, on in, both in housing and in other areas, you know, so to the degree that syncs up with the strategic planning effort, um, you know, that's something I'd be um, excited to contribute to. So. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Nate, the next is an update on Wayfinders. Sure. So, you know, Wayfinders in the town have been working to uh, move the projects forward at um, E Street School and Belchertown Road. And uh, there's three pieces. There's the land development agreement, which is, you know, the contract between them. Uh, and then they also have requested ARPA and CPA funds. So all those documents are really in final stages. And then they're hoping to um, start actually their comprehensive permit process by submitting their project eligibility to the state, um, I think this month. And so uh, maybe next month, but you know, really that they're trying to submit it as one project, uh, two sites, one project. And so that would, you know, that's something that would then be going through permitting uh, this winter, spring. Um, you know, I, I think it will be, uh, you know, it, if approved, I think it's a really competitive project, but, you know, I think we all know that funding can be, can be tricky. And so, you know, they're, um, they're trying to reach out to different organizations at the state level, uh, just because it is, it's a unique project. There's uh, historic preservation and reuse of the school building on one site. There is a new building on another site, uh, deep affordability. And so, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it's great that it'll, it'll, it'll start. And so, um, you know, I think that right now, uh, you know, some of the neighbors support it. I think once it really, once this project eligibility phase gets kicked off, then, you know, more of the community will be noticed. Uh, and then there'll be a 30 day comment period. Uh, and so, you know, that'll probably happen in the next month or two. And so then it really, that kind of starts the kind of big public engagement piece. So. Nick, can I just ask you, when you say the big public engagement piece, um, is does Wayfinder have a plan for that? Oh, we did do a community forum last fall. Um, should we be thinking about another community forum because we're now at the point where they might break ground? Um, so I think it's important for us to think about, I mean, we could reach out to them as well or have them come and talk to us about that. Yeah, and I think that's a good idea. I've, um, I've uh, spoken with a few abutters and property owners and you know, I know Wayfinder has too. And so, I think maybe having a, a kind of a bigger kind of broader public meeting would be important. And I think, you know, um, I have a meeting with them, I think next week, I, I could bring that up uh, because we don't want to, you know, catch everyone off guard. It is great that they're talking to immediate neighbors, but it'd be nice to have, you know, just maybe a bigger, a bigger meeting. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think because this has been a, a longer process. Um, you know, people may not realize that, you know, they had submitted a request for proposal, it was public and they had concept designs and, you know, right, there's been a, the trust work job, you know, the RFP and it's been a few years in the making. And so it might be nice just to get everyone up to speed on that. Great idea. Um, I mean, we, we did have, as I said before, we had the community engagement forum last year, but it's very different when you're starting to break ground and you're starting to see a lot of traffic both on Southeast Street and then on Belgertown Road. Once people start getting a little inconvenienced by construction, that's when usually you have some issues. So having a plan beforehand in terms of how is that going to happen? Um, how do we mitigate any um, sort of disruption in people's lives as we create this you know, wonderful project. Mm -hmm. Yep, Grover, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just have a curiosity if that is generally part of Wayfinders or development. I've heard them present community engagement plans, but also, so if we should wait to hear from them, slash also, I, I've heard a lot about the conflict that preceded my time here about the um, East Gables that was just opened. And I just wonder if there's a way of like messaging or signage or something that we could 
proactively set the tone or the frame of this convert like the public conversation of like great news housing for like families is you know being built here across the street from this school the you know largest school that's going to be in our town right like kind of pre-setting the frame how much uh, value or benefit we might get by getting an early jump on it thank you for over allegra um sorry i would i just press two buttons and one of them accidentally disconnected me from audio for a second so i apologize if i'm repeating what grover might have said but one thing that I think that we can think about in terms of messaging, A, in terms of like traffic and stuff, is there is going to be a school building being built right there too, which I think would be a great like community building piece for like, look, we're building all this housing for families. They can walk to school. There's going to be this brand new school. Um, so I, I feel like trying to work in partnership with something you know, because the school building project ended up having a lot of community support so i i think building off of that momentum perhaps we can tack on like well hey and now they're you know we're worried about declining enrollment now look we're building a place for families to live and they can walk right to the school through these beautiful gardens and everything so I, that would be maybe one thing to think about in terms of messaging yeah and i i'd be curious to hear a timeline too because like I, don't, I just saw an email before I joined that I, I, my kids go to Fort River, that there's like a principal and PGO meeting happening in a couple of weeks there is like, at what point is it like, let's make some flyers and hand them out to parents, right? Like that, I'm, I'm thinking of that kind of proactive. Um, yeah, I think those are really good points. So yeah, I, um, uh, staff is meeting with Wayfinders on Monday to talk through um, some of these legal agreements just have to be, um, I think Wayfinders has signed them. The town has to then execute them. So it's it's really, you know, if that happens um, in the next week or two, then, uh, you know, I think they want to move pretty fast on submitting their um, PEL, which would make it public. And, and when I say bigger public, it just means all of a sudden now, you know, it, the information is public, but once they submit it to the state, they kick it back. We actually have to be advertised it as a comment, 30 day comment period. And so um, I do like the idea of having something uh, and framing it um, you know, there are other projects planned for East Amherst, <laughs> all for the benefit of of, um, of residents. But, you know, we're hoping to redo Route 9 from the intersection of Southeast Street near Cumberland's all the way down to the bridge. And so, you know, bike lanes and, you know, wider sidewalks and we're redoing the street and sidewalks in front of the East Street School, putting in new water and sewer lines. And so there's a lot happening there. Um you know, right, it, it'll be disruptive for a bit, but in the end, the idea is that it'll be a much nicer setting and community. So yeah, I, you know, I, I think um, it's a town project. Uh, it's a, you know, the town land, uh, Wayfinders were kind of both sponsors. And so I think on Monday, I, I just made a note, I think we'll bring that up in terms of how, how do we manage this and who, who takes a lead and, you know, we should probably get it moving. So it gets tricky because typically once Wayfinders starts running with it, we become a regulatory piece, the town, you know, we permit it. So then we're not usually, you know, the trust could be advocating it, but say for staff or my perspective, we usually will then be working with it from, you know, a legal and permitting perspective and not doing, um, you know, more of the community outreach. And so I think it's a good, good discussion point for Monday just to see where, what they're thinking. I've encouraged them to actually, uh, do this. And so I don't know if they're going to come and have an idea on Monday or what, but I think it's, it's great to be talking about it. It sounds like we might want them to come and present to us where we can then work with them to do this. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. That sounds I, good to me. Yeah. Um, your next item, um, Nate was planning board discussion regarding zoning and affordable housing. Yeah. Just to keep the trust, you know, um, kind of aware of what's happening. I, I think there's, you know, there, there's a number of things in town, right? Both kind of policy and other things. There's the, um, you know, we mentioned the transfer fee uh, that council was looking at, you know, the um, community resources committee, the subcommittee, the council has been looking at a new rental registration uh, bylaw, maybe looking at a nuisance property bylaw. Uh, what the planning board is looking at is rezoning different areas in town to allow for, you know, infill and more density. And right now the focus is on university drive 
so from Amity Street, you know, um, down uh, to Route 9 and having, you know, an overlay or a zoning district that could allow for, you know, redevelopment of those properties with, you know, four story buildings and much more density than there is now. And the planning board members are pretty supportive of this. I think, you know, we it's really in the early phases. We haven't reached out to property owners or anyone else. Um, you know, my proposal was that I'd love to see a thousand beds down there, you know, so that's, it's a pretty big number. Um, you know, I don't know if people like that or not, but, uh, you know, so we've just started, I just wanted the trust to be aware of it. You know, I think it's difficult to, uh, you know, determine the end user, right, of a project. And so, you know, through zoning, we could say it has certain setbacks and the buildings can be a certain design or style and it can look nice when you have street trees. The market might push, uh, you know, to have expensive housing. And so I think the planning board is aware of that. And some members are talking about, you know, what are incentives or tools we could use to, we don't necessarily want to discourage students, but, you know, try to have other housing opportunity. And so it's all part of the equation. I mean, it's really complicated. Um, we've met with UMass officials. The planning board did uh, the other month and talked to them about uh, what their kind of, um, what their thoughts are on, you know, student housing and what their plan would be in the next three to five years. And so I think it was a really, again, that was probably the first in a few meetings with representatives from UMass and really trying to encourage them uh, to think about what their impact is in terms of um, the housing market on the town and what, you know, how we could partner with them. So, you know, I really think that it, um, I love this, you know, university drive piece to move faster, you know, like by the end of the year, have a proposal. I, I think that's probably optimistic, but there are, you know, things the planning board is looking at ways to densify certain areas. And so, you know, I'll just, you know, I can bring it up to the trust when, when it's necessary, but I just want to let you know that those are conversations that are happening. Thank you. And, um, it's important for us to know too. So if we have opportunities to support or work with the planning board, um, that would be really important. So um, thanks. So keep us updated on where, how that's moving. A thousand beds sounds wonderful, <laughs> uh, but I've driven up and down there wondering like where exactly, but you know, that's, that's sort of future conversation. Um, anybody else regarding uh, what Nate just shared with us? Okay. All right. So then the uh, next Ashley. is, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Ashley. I Sorry, I didn't see your yeah, hand. Sorry. You know, I was just going to say that, you know, students are low income people. Can, it is a policy issue, but can you, is there ways to get the university to prioritize their low income students? I mean, is that even possible or do they just not care? They just want the numbers. Yeah, that was actually, um, it was really nice. The president of the Student Government Association attended remotely and provided comments at one of the meetings and said that, you know, some of the housing is really not affordable for students. And so, you know, they, they're they aware of it. I, I think, um, you know, they didn't, we didn't address that topic specifically, but I do think it's something to consider. Uh, it was brought up that the new housing uh, on Mass Ave is very expensive, <laughs> um, really expensive. And so, yeah, I think some of it is, um, you know, we, I think it's just, there's a, such a demand for housing. And so, you know, there was some talk about how can the town or UMass, you know, essentially manipulate uh, the cost of housing, whether it's, you know, someone, I think someone mentioned rent control, but right, what are measures that could happen? Uh, it's just, it's something that, um, you know, the town doesn't control what happens on campus. It's a, you know, um, in terms of their housing, but it is something that was brought up that the cost of housing, even on campus is expensive for students. And so, you know, I, I think I said it was a initial conversation uh, and the idea was that they would come back. We provided them a list of questions, a lot of questions that we'd want to have then answered. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping it becomes a conversation over the next six months. Uh, Allegra and then Grover. Um, so this question is about public private partnerships, which I think is what the housing on um, Mass Ave was. Um, but two questions. One, do they not collect property taxes on that because of the public piece of the partnership? And then two, does that also mean that they're not subject to any of the inclusionary zoning 
that would trigger affordable units being built. Right and right. Okay. So the um, you know the the new project on Mass Ave is on UMass land. It was a private developer, and it's going to be privately managed. So essentially, it's um, apartments for students that are on campus that are privately managed. And so uh, other UMass Boston has done this. And I think there's probably some disagreement over whether or not it can be taxed, but currently they're not taxed. And, um, you know, they the developer then kind of sets the price. Um, and there's, you know, there's, um, as you know, essentially it's on UMass land. So it's, it's a student housing is not subject to inclusionary zoning. Um, so it, it typically wouldn't be, I think for instance, um, there's the area, you know, we, we call it the gateway. It's where the fraternities had been demolished. And now it's a green space on North Pleasant street, uh, that that's university owned. And depending on what the zoning is and what happens, I mean, maybe there could be affordable units there, but it's tricky when it's university owned, uh, even if it's outside the you know university zoning district. You know, we have an educational zoning district, but typically those housing for students is not subject to inclusionary zoning. All right, thank you. Well, that would be a good bill. I mean, like that would be something that would help a lot of people I wish that Mindy Dom would work on that. <laughs> uh, so, go ahead, Grover. Yeah, well, actually, Ashley, bridging to that, and I think her assistant, Grace, is here to hear this. Um, I just want to note that um, and say it out loud into the record that I would like us in our strategic planning and and continuing through the year ahead of meeting to think um, strategically and in terms of potential coalitions or really, I would like us to to be part of thinking creatively about how to press the university to actually provide some more of the housing. I know they came and presented to us I heard what they had to say. I didn't always agree with everything that they had to say in terms of okay. their frame or what they accepted as um, a given or as normal. And also we had the student um, activists call in. And so I'm saying here that I would love for them to rejoin us for future meetings, love to keep working with them. And um, yeah, because I I hear what you say, Ashley, you know, I was unhoused when I was in college. I slept in my van for part of the time in order to finish college. And it's very normal and it's um, not not good for learning. Right. And it's uh, unacceptable. And also, um, yeah, I think that pitting the, you know, this tension of like student housing versus those of us who are living here potentially forever is the wrong setup. And um, I'm really interested in us working for long-term solutions. And, and UMass has a lot of land. When I drive through, they have open spaces um, that also could be built on for student housing. So I'm just saying that here and really hopeful that um, I, I agree that's something that could potentially go into the housing bill. Oh, and the last thing I wanted to say was that the, there's a new secretary of higher education who lives in Northampton and who was part of innovating a lot of really amazing policies at um, uh, Holyoke Community College that serve low income students um, in really explicit ways. And so I think she might be a good partner in maybe changing some of the laws that Massachusetts state owned um, universities have about housing. I'd like us to consider that. Uh, I think Ashley put her hand up and next Carol. Go ahead, Ashley. Yeah, it's, it, it is like, there's a, a lot of affluent, you know, Amherst people that just really are like, you know, they want the rent of students. And so we got to talk about kind of the structural issues. Basically, students are paying a $1,000 and we really need to take those people on like a little bit more than we ever have, <laughs> you know? 
because that's the problem. Thank you, Ashley. Carol? Um, I was just going to say, it seemed to me somehow, I'm not sure how I got this out of it, but in the conversation with the, with the thing with the governor and what was in the bill and John suggesting that the way to solve it was build 3,000 places for people to live on the University of Massachusetts campus. Because when we here get to talk to UMass, we are down here somewhere, you know, and what has to happen is the chancellor. I think we need, well, I think we need to go through the state to get the state to change what it's telling the university to have to do. Because Amherst talking to UMass is like, just doesn't get anywhere. I think that we need a different strategy. And maybe there's something that we should look at the bond bill carefully and see if there isn't something that we think should be in there in order to try to address this. Um, I, can, I concur Amherst will never do anything about UMass. We The state has to do it. The town of Amherst will never take on UMass. I mean, when it tries, it doesn't, it's not successful. I mean, I it feel like it doesn't even try. It doesn't even oh, try. I don't know if I, let's not argue about that. I don't know if I agree with you, it but let's try. not argue. Whatever it is that's happening, it isn't working. And so a new right. strategy from a different direction would, I failure. think, would be a good idea. Yeah, and and I think um, the governor heard um, the president of our town council, uh, John, we all sort of said, you know, the, the elephant in the room is UMass, uh, not as, you know, there, there are a lot of benefits, um, but it has a huge impact on affordability and includes students and includes their own staff. Um, and so there needs to be, you know, there needs to be a resolution. And I agree with Carol, I think the pressure and the incentives have to come from above. And so, you know, when we saw in the bond bill, this um, section around seasonal, recognizing seasonal communities designation, it was great, you know, that our president, and we also looked at it and said, oh, does that include college towns? Um, and she recommended that there, you know, there be a focus on um, use of academic calendars and having um, towns that have colleges in there also be looked at um, as very, um, as communities that need um, responses to resolving the impact of that uh, of those colleges on them. All right. Um, any other comments? It's been a great conversation. Um, all right. So the next is a financial account. Nate, you were just going to any anybody have any questions for Nate regarding um, the handout that was submitted to us, which is uh, since September um, our finances. Any questions about that? I was going to say that, you know, the um, the account balance looks pretty big in the development funds, but we had to, you know, what wasn't reflected was the amount for Valley CDC and now for Craig's doors. And so the trust really has, you know, a balance. It could just be 200,000. I guess say only. It'd be really nice to have that. But, um, you know, you know, if you say, if you look at it, you're like, wow, it's 800,000. Well, really it's 200,000. And so I think, um, you know, projects can really, it takes a lot of funding sometimes. So the trust uh, did put in, you know, a request for more CPA funds. Um, but I think, you know, just moving forward, you know, being strategic and, you know, judicious about how how those funds are allocated. And so um, I can update that once things happen. But, um, uh, you know, those two requests do take up a lot of the development budget for those two, you know, those two fundings. And that's one of the reasons why we've advocated for the real estate transfer fee. We need some funding. Um, the more funding we have, the more we're able to act um, on supporting affordable housing projects or initiatives. Allegra? Um, I was just wondering for our next meeting, if it would be possible to get an accounting of where ARPA funds have gone so far for the affordable housing line items that they were put, you know, the $2 million basically. Um, so that we can see what that looks like, especially if we're thinking about our own funds and if that has already been leveraged for projects or not. Is that something you think you can find out, Nate? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. I mean, Fantastic. Uh, you know, the county use ARPA funds to purchase the former VFW site. 
and do some work there. Um, uh, we put uh, some ARPA funds to um, a few other could things, you, but. Could you like bring like the numbers? Like here, we had $2 million and this went here and that one there and that one there. Yeah, that yeah. would be a great way to see it. I'd yeah, love that. So, yeah. I mean, um, Allegra's right. I think there there was actually like two point two million. There was a million for um, kind of like sheltering and homelessness, a million for housing, and then I think two hundred thousand for uh, uh, rental subsidy or services. And so I could try to you know get uh, get a breakdown of all that. Great, great, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so the next, our next item is any announcements. I have two. Um, I sent an email about the MPHA alert regarding uh, Senate Bill 1299 and House Bill 2103, which is an act of enabling cities and towns to stabilize rents and protect tenants, rent control. Um, and there is going to be a public hearing uh, on 1114, which I believe is a Tuesday at 11 a.m., um, and there's a link if you want to uh, provide testimony in, uh, virtually, or actually in person, I believe. Um, and I'm sure you can do it virtually. And then you can also submit your comments. Um, so I, I would like for us to consider submitting a letter of support for, for those. Um, do it. Go ahead. Just do it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's hey. something talked about just make sure there's nobody who has any so, any comments or objections or i don't no. think so okay i don't think so um and um the other uh, i think is also very important um so valley cdc has already started going in front of the zoning board um and uh, i also sent that out uh thank you jessica allen and and laura bakers here if anybody has any questions um but um there are different dates with different topics um, we have submitted our letter of support. I've submitted an individual letter of support. I think others have as well. Um, but it is also very important to attend and they will have public comments. I noted December 21st, the topics there is extreme interest for me, um, but I will try to make um, some of them. But you have the schedule of when they will be in front of the ZBA and what the topics are for that evening. Um, and any other announcements? Okay. All right. So I'm going to open up for public comments. Uh, any public comments from attendees? Okay. Not seeing any hands up. Um, any items not anticipated in the last 48 hours? Comments, topics? Okay. So future meetings. Um, so I have actually sent a... Um, uh, uh, I've spoken to Michelle Miller. This was, uh, I discussed this at, I think, the October uh, trust meeting about having the uh, African Heritage Reparation Assembly um, chair being Michelle Miller or representatives come and talk to us about the recommendations around affordable housing. Um, so I actually had an opportunity to speak to Michelle Miller and she asked me to follow up with an email, which I have done. Um, I've let her also know, you know, it's, uh, we meet on the second uh Thursday of the month. I've not yet heard back, um, but she was very excited to be able to have a conversation with us, um, but I've not heard back when they might be available to do so. So that might be a future meeting. Um, we just talked about having Wayfinders come and talk to us about their community engagement and outreach and how we can help with that. Um, and then our next housing trust meeting is December 14th. Uh, and hopefully we'll have um, a full membership by then. Um, it'll be very exciting if we have all of our vacancies filled. Um, and we also hope to um, be able to soon tell you when our uh, first strategic planning meeting will be. And we agreed that we would try to um, meet in person so we can also get to know each other a little bit better before we start digging deeply into um, creating a strategic plan. Um, and I believe that is all I have um, let me just open it up to see if anybody has any comments. I just want to comment. Thank you very much, Erica, for doing the whole thing since I had to do something else first. Thank you. Well, we're tag team. We're up. We're a wonderful tag team, but there also looks like there's somebody has the end up. Ashley. Leg. Yeah, Ashley. Oh, sorry. I was, I was just thinking that the way that, um, we are going to help people that, you know, Tim McCarthy is helping 
directly could be a model that we could use with reparations with other people that are low income and that helps people directly i mean it could be in any different kinds of ways and two hundred thousand dollars that's just sitting there is not paying anybody's rent and so you know there are homeless people and there are people struggling and christmas is coming up we're not paying anybody's rent why don't we use our money to help people and we really think about doing that in december Okay, well, uh, do you want me to put this down as an item um, on the agenda in terms of how you propose for us to do that? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, definitely. That okay. we pick another, that we basically just pick another entity, and it could even be Craig's door, and we just give them more money, or it could even be you know, reparations committee, and they do the exact same thing, or, you know, it could be any number of, you know, nonprofit that we trust, it could be the Amherst Survival Center. I mean, we could, it could be a thing we do every Christmas, because $200,000 isn't helping any homeless person right now. We have a lot of money, we should be using it to help people all the time. Okay, thank you. I'll put it on the agenda for December for discussion. And um, uh, Ashley, if you want to um, think about, you know, what are the different organizations and, and the specifics of it, um, you will be on the agenda to present that to the group and we can discuss it and then we can move forward with that. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. It is 8.55. Uh, not seeing any other hands up. Uh, either from panelists or attendees, I am going to close our meeting for this evening. And I want to thank everyone. Uh, welcome again, Greg, but thank all of you, both uh, all of the trust members as well as attendees um, who've taken the time to have a very rich conversation and really move our agenda around supporting the most vulnerable individuals um, in getting stable and safe housing. So thank you. Good night, all. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs>